Lynn asked me to present this article. This is an article that we had been working on for some time. And, I, and for disclosure's sake, uh, Jeremy Sokolov, who recently from Stanford, who recently went to industry, was actually a lead author on this and, and led this effort. And uh, so I want to obviously give him credit for this. Um, obviously, uh, there's been a long-standing interest in cigarette smoking, not only in rheumatoid arthritis, but many other conditions. And this is a study we did in the early 2000s with a group from UCSF and, and UAB looking at data from the Iowa Women's Health Study. And I don't know how familiar folks are with this study. This was a, a study originally designed to look at risk for breast cancer among elderly women in Iowa. And, one of the take-home lessons, if you ever want to do a long prospective follow-up in women, go to Iowa. Um, the follow-up rates were just unbelievable, um, like 95% participation rates. Um, in this study, what we did is we actually did, this is a nested case control study, and did chart review uh, the old-fashioned way, uh, no EHR, did old-fashioned chart review, and identified incident cases of rheumatoid arthritis during prospective follow-up. And not surprising, particularly in retrospect, strong associations with cigarette smoking in a dose-related way. The risk looks very much akin to what we talk about with lung cancer in the sense that when women in this cohort had quit smoking, dose-related effect that goes away with time. And so after someone has quit for more than 10 to 20 years, your risk looks like other people in the population. Um, I think one of the important figures that you'll hear about with cigarette smoking and rheumatoid arthritis is right here, the attributable risk of almost 20%, meaning we abolish the risk factor, we get rid of one in five new cases of rheumatoid arthritis, which uh, is pretty powerful. So there's been some really interesting studies, and I went over some of these last night in regards to the relationship of um, cigarette smoking, and this is one that was done by a Swedish group. Just so, so why might rheumatoid arthritis, why might smoking uh, be an instigator for this? And this is a pretty simple study, a simple study for the doctors, maybe not so simple for the patients who participated, but this was a study where they took smokers and non-smokers and looked at BAL washings and just asked the question, is citrullination more common in the lung specimens from smokers compared to non-smokers? Important given that immune responses to citrullinated peptides are so specific in the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. And indeed, they found more citrullination in the lung washings from these smoke cigarette smokers. And as well, an increase in the expression of peptidyl arginine deaminase, the enzyme that's charged with catalyzing the conversion of arginine to citrullinated peptides. And we also know from other literature that the the lung is chock full of antigens that have been implicated in rheumatoid arthritis, including things like vimentin, fibrinogen, et cetera. And clearly citrullinated uh, vimentin and fibrinogen and peptides drive many of the ACPA responses that are characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis. And this is a slide, I think a really, really elegant study done by Kevin Dean and his group in the University of Colorado where they took relatives of rheumatoid arthritis patients, so first degree relatives, and did serologic testing on all of these relatives, none of whom had any articular complaints at the time of the study. And what they did is they categorized these relatives based on seropositivity for autoantibodies. And they found 42 of these individuals who they deemed to be high risk, either CCP positive or positive for multiple rheumatoid factor assays. And then they also looked at autoantibody negative FDRs and 12 patients with early but established rheumatoid arthritis, so classifiable rheumatoid arthritis. And what they showed um, quite nicely using blinded readings of these high-res CTs is that the first-degree relatives who were autoantibody positive were much more likely to have airway abnormalities on their HRCT, I mean, in a striking way. And almost approaching that that you see with early classifiable rheumatoid arthritis, and in those patients it was a vast majority, so 92% of early rheumatoid arthritis patients who were seropositive show these changes in their airways, suggesting that the airway may be a nidus for the inflammation that we see subsequently in rheumatoid arthritis. This is another study, I think, that really adds to this uh, emerging story with the lung, and that's this, uh, this this group, uh, also a group from, net, um, from uh, Europe, looked at early patients with rheumatoid arthritis, the vast majority of whom were seropositive for ACPA or CCP antibody, and 
looked at their HRCTs and again, high rates of lung abnormalities on the HRCT with a kind of a variety of findings actually. Uh, localized airway inflammation, uh, parenchymal changes. Um, but I think really the, the neat part of the story was uh, what I talked about last night is the med, school, med student study. And that is they did BALs and transbronchial biopsies on a subset of these patients. And um, very interestingly, uh, looked at ACPA in the BAL and compared that to paired serum samples. So the same patient serving as his or her own control. And what they found after they normalized those values to total immunoglobulin levels is you see that ACPA, both IgG and IgA subtypes, much more calm, much more high, higher concentration in the BAL than the serum, which would suggest at least on the surface that those antibodies are being produced locally in the lung uh, and perhaps, perhaps not as much uh, uh, elsewhere. They also showed from the biopsy specimens that rheumatoid arthritis patients much more likely to have ectopic lymphoid tissues, similar to what we see in the synovium of an inflamed joint, and that we know will support uh, a mature autoimmune responses. So a little bit more about smoking RA risk. Clearly, I th think unless, you're, unless the fellows have been living under a shell, you know that cigarette smoking is the strongest risk factor for development of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, most strongly linked, and some would say only linked, with ACPA positive disease. So when you really look at smoking and seronegative RA, really not much association. Um, this is a bar graph from uh, Kahlberg's study several years ago and shows that this association with disease risk, and in particular, ACPA positive disease risk, is really driven by underlying genetics. So there is a very potent gene environment interaction in this risk, in that people who have HLA-DRB1 shared epitope allele, uh, who are positive for that, and particularly homozygotes, have a very, very strong risk. You see odds ratios in the range of 30 to 40-fold risk for development of rheumatoid arthritis, which is really an astounding uh, risk when you think about it. And so the hypothesis, hypothesis that em has emerged is really uh, shown here is that patients have mucosal irritation and large part we do that through cigarette smoking and similar, similar uh, ambient pollutants. This causes localized uh, airway inflammation um, leading to oxidative stress and post-translational changes in peptides and proteins that follow and in particular citrullination, but probably also other changes. We probably uh, very likely see MA modification, which is a, a, a compo which is a byproduct of oxidative stress, in addition to carbamylated proteins or homocitrulline, all of which have been implicated in rheumatoid arthritis. The hypothesis then is that, that individuals develop these autoantibodies, these antibodies enter the circulation, and there's probably, there probably needs to be a second hit, a second hit that causes citronated uh, antigen to be present in the joint, trauma to the joint, viral infection, et cetera. And that's been the hypothesis that was really initiated by Lars Klerskog uh, more than 10 years ago. And so obviously there's been other uh, pulmonary toxins linked to rheumatoid arthritis. Talked about a few of these last night. Probably the one that's been uh, written about most is silica exposure. So silica portends a risk that is somewhat uh, very similar to what we see with cigarette smoking. Risk for CCP or ACPA positive disease. Uh, and among people who are exposed to silica, so rock blasters and uh, uh, people who work in sand pits, et cetera, you see a risk that's increased, about a 70% a increased risk for the development of ACPA positive disease. There have been some inconsistent studies, and you can imagine doing this study. It's not an easy study, but looking at ambient air pollution. I think one of the more interesting studies uh, came from the Nurses Health Study, where they showed that patients who live close to major highways, and they used EPA data sets, showed this risk uh, for increased rheumatoid arthritis based on your, uh, your distance, your residence um, from these uh, uh, interstates and highways. Alcohol has been implicated in rheumatoid arthritis, but interestingly, more as a protective uh, environmental risk factor, although there appears to be a real dose uh, dependency on that, meaning low, moderate drinking, probably very, probably protective. 
when you get into excessive amounts of alcohol, it may actually flip. It may be uh, risk uh, adverse. And so, you know, you don't think of alcohol with airway inflammation, but that's actually not true. So alcohol is a very potent stimulus, and there's a NIAAA funds uh, researchers around the country in the tunes of millions of dollars looking at the relationship of alcohol intake and COPD and emphysema, uh, problems with cili ciliary motility, et cetera. We have a center at UNMC that is focused on this. Showing data here from one study, just showing the protective association. This is a Swedish uh, cohort study showing a protective association of alcohol intake and rheumatoid arthritis risk. Well, this is a, an attempt, I think one of the first attempts by a group from the Nurses' Health Study and from a Swedish cohort um, to ask the question, can we take cigarette smoking, can we take all that we know about genetic risk factors, other demographics, and can we use those to predict who is going to develop rheumatoid arthritis in the future? Great idea. I mean, you can imagine if we could predict accurately who in this room was at risk for imminent development of rheumatoid arthritis, we could likely intervene and prevent lots of problems down, downstream. Well, when we do that, and we, we can look at the red line, which is the best model, which includes all the genetic variables, all the environmental risk factors, um, um, you can see that we don't quite predict that. So we have a lot to learn still here. So sm associations with, between smoking and disease severity or activity, so we know that there's a strong risk between cigarette smoking, tobacco use, and development of ACPA-positive rheumatoid arthritis, particularly if you have the wrong genes or you had the wrong parents. What we know far less about is, you know, when we counsel our patients who have established RA, are we fibbing when we say, you should quit smoking because it'll help your RA? Who does that in this room? Yeah, I do it too, but I'm not above fibbing. Are you above fibbing? So what's the data for that? Um, the data is not great. Um, so there are several observational studies that have shown that smoking is associated with rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP antibody expression, that it is associated with the appearance or occurrence of extra-articular uh, features, particularly ILD, not surprising, but more importantly, uh, subcutaneous nodules is one that shows up repeatedly in the literature. There are some studies looking at erosive disease and that smokers have higher rates of smoking disease. Somewhat inconsistent findings, though, in the literature, to be honest. And higher joint counts at presentation. Those are some of the data that's uh, been out there. So I would argue smoking cessation uh, as an intervention has been subject to limited studies. There's really two good observational smoking cessation studies uh, in the literature, one from Corona and there's an, uh, another one as well, fairly limited in duration in terms of follow-up and numbers. So the ends in those studies, you're talking about 100 to, I think it, in one study, to 300 in another study. So we've also asked the question, uh, and there's been inconsistent findings in the literature on this, with does smoking retard your response to different therapies? Does it retard your response to DMARDs, et cetera? And again, there's been inconsistent reports in the literature. And so there's been observational studies that have suggested that if you smoke, you're much more likely to require step up in your therapy. You're more likely to fail methotrexate uh, monotherapy and require the addition of biologics. From the British uh, Biologic Res Registry, they actually showed lower response rates to infliximab, but what's interesting in that study, a very borderline association, uh, a adverse effect in terms of infliximab response, but no effect on a Tanercept response. And that, so, you know, just from a biologic uh, perspective, I have trouble with that in terms of the consistency of those results. What I'm showing here, these are figures that, uh, you know, they look like overlays because this is from the TIER study. And what we did is we identified current smokers using cotinine levels. Again, not perfect, but a pretty good way to identify people who are currently smoking. And because there wasn't smoking data actually collected with the, the study, uh, uh, self-reported data. So using cotinine uh, levels as a surrogate 
you can see that current smoking and those who are not current smokers really had, no matter what the treatment they received, almost identical uh, treatment responses over time. So in that study, we really didn't see uh, any, bene any benefit from being a non-smoker in terms of treatment response. So the paper that Lynn asked me to present, there was really uh, two primary aims and, and a hypothesis under each of those. So the aims were to examine the association of current smoking status with disease activity in RA. And the hypothesis that uh, Jeremy Sokolov had proposed was that current smoking would be associated with more disease activity. I think that's kind of the obvious thing you'd go into this with based on the inconsistent literature. Uh, and that both, and this would be true both in terms of clinical parameters but also cytokine expression, which his lab uh, generated for us, and I'll show you that. And then to dissect the potential mechanisms that might drive this, and his hypothesis was that this would be associated, you, you, driven by differences in ACPA expression. Uh, so current smokers would have higher ACPA, he believes, and, and there's been many articles to suggest that ACPA are not only surrogate markers, that they're directly pathogenic. So if cigarette smoking increased your ACPA expression relative to former smokers, it would suggest that ACPA might drive that relationship, if that's true. So in terms of methods, a little bit more, this is a cross-sectional study, and we'll come back to that because that is by far and above uh, the biggest weakness to this uh, effort. It involved 1,130 patients from the Vera Registry. Just a little bit about the Vera Registry. This is a registry that uh, we started in Omaha uh, in the early 2000s, and now involves 13 sites around the country. These are all, as it would sound, U.S. veterans who have classifiable ACR uh, classification for rheumatoid arthritis, and can't see the map very well, but just shows the kind of sites that are kind of spotted all over the country. We used a multiplex cytokine chemokine array that's been optimized for the issue of rheumatoid factor, and you all know that if you don't optimize these assays for rheumatoid factor, you get false elevations uh, and sometimes false decrements in the, acti in the levels. We looked at disease activity, so in, when you're in Vera, at every clinic visit, patients have a standard, standardized exam that includes joint counts, uh, physician and patient globals, pain scores, et cetera, all the eight core ACR measures of disease activity, and those get uploaded uh, in an automated fashion into the data set. And so we have longitudinal um, uh, uh, disease activity measures. But this study has really focused on that cross-sectional analysis at the time of enrollment when we had banked uh, samples. And then the exposure was self-reported smoking status. We can talk about that, but current, former, and never smoking status. And then we did our primary analysis in CCP-positive patients. And the, the rationale behind this really is that, you know, we know that Smoking is associated with development of CCP positive disease, not CCP negative disease. And we wanted to explore whether the same might be true for disease activity. In other words, is the association of smoking with disease activity really limited to that CCP positive cohort, or does it extend into the seronegative group as well? So we did comparisons by group of uh, uh, cytokine levels. And what we used here is really a cytokine score which is a, a sum of fluorescent values from the, from the microarray bead. We did an ANOVA, Kruskal Wallace as needed, uh, pretty standard uh, statistical approaches. We wanted to see what analytes on the cytokine panel in particular were elevated, and to do that, you do a statistical analysis of microarray or SAM analysis, which is very difficult to do a multivariate analysis using that kind of data. So what we did is we did a matched design where we had 107 current, former, and never smokers matched by age, uh, sex, and disease duration, and then looked to see whether there were analytes that were different uh, uh, by those groups. And so these are the uh, descriptors of the patient population. And any time you write a paper on VERA, what do you think the number one critique from a reviewer is? Generalizability. You know, so this is a, it's a VA population. So it's, a, it's approximately 90% men. It's not like other RA cohorts, I mean, anywhere. And that is uh, both a strength, depending on how you look at life, uh, or a weakness, depending if you're a reviewer. And so that's a common critique we, we attempt to handle. Um, 
So just a couple other things that I'd point out about the smoking group. The smoking group uh, in terms of current smokers are generally younger um, and have low, uh, less disease duration. Um, and uh, that was the main thing I wanted to point out. Some differences, uh, as you can see, in the use of methotrexate, which is perhaps relevant. Um, and perhaps related to a known lung disease where we as physicians shy away from methotrexate use, perhaps. So disease activity by smoking status in the study, and what you can see um, is that uh, consistent with the original hypothesis, we saw that DOS28 and other variables, including the provider global C-reactive protein levels, and a, a multi-dimensional hack score, all uh, uh, worse in the current smoking group compared to the former and never smoking group, um, with the, and highly significant between groups uh, uh, in favor of current smokers looking worse, with the exception of CRP. When you do a between group analysis of CRP, you don't see that difference. And so when we carry that over to the cytokine analysis, Again, we see these higher values of uh, cytokine uh, score uh, in current versus both former and never smokers, although I would point out the former smokers have somewhat intermediate values there. And again, just to remind you, it's an analysis we did limited to the CCP positive individuals. And then when you look at cytokine number, and what cytokine number is, that's a little bit of a misnomer. It's really cytokine in high concentration. So what that is, is it's a number of cytokines that are found two standard deviations above the mean in the RA cohort. So these are, you know, sky high values. And you can see that current smokers uh, are, have higher numbers of these cytokines in high concentration compared to both the former and never group. And again, you know, just on the surface, this would suggest in the CCP positive cohort that current smoking has adverse effects on disease activity relative to the former and, and never smoking groups. I think what was interesting, and, and unfortunately, in the wake of at least two sets of reviews, we had analyses on this, the seronegative group up front in that report, and they got put back into supplemental material, which often happens, it seems like, more and more these days in these reports. And what it showed is in the seronegative group, which is fairly sizable in this population, it's uh, in the hundreds of patients, showed a fairly flat effect, meaning you don't see this association with smoking in the CCP negative group. It just isn't really there. All three groups look fairly similar in terms of their disease activity levels. Uh, for those who are really interested and have their favorite cytokine, you know, cytokine of the week club, um, here are the cytokines that popped out uh, in current smoking when we did the matched analysis, IL-2, IL-6, IL-12, uh, TNF-alpha, GM-CSF, MCP-1, interferon gamma. You know, these are all ones you hear about in rheumatoid arthritis pathogenesis. And there were several on the panel. It was a panel that looked at 17 analytes. There were several that I have listed there that, that didn't appear to be associated uh, with smoking. So... Getting back to Dr. Sokolov's original hypothesis, his hypothesis would be that we would see higher ACPA concentrations in the current smokers that would drive this uh, compared to both former and never smokers. And his, you know, as happens occasionally in our lives, our hypothesis wasn't right in that really the for current and former smokers, their ACPA concentrations looked very similar. Um, it was, however, a, a little bit different story for rheumatoid factor. And in, with rheumatoid factor, you did see the stair-step association uh, with smoking status, meaning the highest concentrations of rheumatoid factor uh, were in the current smokers with an intermediate values in the former smokers and then lowest values in the never smokers uh, and uh, significant in bet between group differences with that. So there are clearly limitations to the study, and I mentioned a few of these already, but it's a cross-sectional design. So is, is uh, quitting smoking driving this? You don't know. There's no way to know from this design. I think it's intriguing, though, that you do see these between-group differences even after adjusting for factors such as treatments received, 
uh, and other factors that we know might influence that. There's obviously, when you get self-report, possible misclassification of exposures. We analyzed that to some degree. We did cotinine levels, as I mentioned earlier, on all these patients. We've previously shown in this cohort that if people who report current smoking, about 94, I think it's 94% or in the 90 percentile, uh, have detectable cotinine levels. Conversely, if people tell us they don't smoke, it's not quite as good, not surprising. When they tell us they don't smoke, about 84, 85% of them have undetectable levels. So we think we've identified the current and uh, the never uh, smokers uh, pretty well. Um, so there's obviously that issue. Um, data relevant to smoking duration and intensity. If you invoke that cigarette smoking is causative, then you really need to be able to examine dose effects. And we don't have that data in Vera. Um, we don't collect pack years of smoking, packs per day, et cetera, that would be really helpful in that analysis. Um, there's a question of other confounders, and that question's come up with an editorial that was submitted that I've seen already, and I'll show some data to that because I think it's a good question. And then there's focus on, uh, you know, the measurement that we did was all IgG ACBA, all IgG. So I talked last night fairly extensively how if you're looking at smoking and you're invoking mucosal irritation, IgA would be a very interesting antibody to look at. So would we see decreases between current and former smoking if we looked at IgA isotypes of CCP? We might. I don't know. There's a way to do that these days. I mean, to some degree. I've, do you guys use the, IG, the CCP 3.1? assay here? Do you know? You're a second generation? So it sounds like you guys use the second generation, which I think is actually the better test to use. The 3.1 assay actually measures IgA CCP. And so it's more sensitive than our CCP2, but it comes at a cost, as not surprisingly, of specificity. But it detects these IgA ACBA. And so it's, it's become interesting because people have leveraged that for research purposes um, to some degree. And then obviously the issue I brought up with generalizability just never escapes uh, this cohort and I think is, a, is, a, uh, is an appropriate question to ask. So this is the question that was raised in an editorial that came up and again I think a great question and it's the question could this all be confounded by anxiety um, or depression, I actually added the anxiety in there because I think they're hard to, in this cohort in particular, often difficult to tease apart. And so we actually did, a price, made me think of our prior analysis we had done actually. So we were asked a couple years ago about associations of PTSD and rheumatoid arthritis outcomes. And so we did our best to look at that. And what we did is Vera is actually linked with national VA databases. So it allows us to do things like what comorbid illnesses do they have, et cetera, uh, in terms of diagnostic coding. So how good are diagnostic codes? Well, in the VA for PTSD, they're actually probably pretty good. And I say that because it's a quality measure in the VA that people get screened for PTSD. And so I think it's probably a pretty good measure. Um, depression codes, I'm not as confident. But so what we did in that study that was published now, I have to look, 2013 in arthritis uh, uh, care and research, as we looked at associations with these codes with how people did over time in the registry in terms of disease activity. And you can see we had 12% of patients who had PTSD right here, and another 24% that had other depressive or anxiety codes. So that's almost a third of the cohort had these codes. Um, the PTSD patients, it's important to point out that a proportion of those probably have comorbid depression as well. They did, a lot of them. Um, and hard to tease apart in this group, uh, the more important factor there. But what we saw in that study were robust associations with subjective measures of outcomes. So if you had PTSD or depression, and this isn't surprising probably to anybody in this room, you take care of these patients. They had higher tender joint counts. They had worse hack scores. They had worse global scores. They had higher tender joint counts, but not swollen joint counts. Uh, they, had, uh, they didn't have differences in sed rate. 
So the more up, what we would think of as more objective measures weren't increased, whereas the more subjective measures were. There was a borderline association with the DOS 28. It actually had a p-value that was under 0.05, but in the study, because of all the multiple outcomes we used, it didn't reach the Bonferroni correction, but you know, we can argue about that. So it's not surprising the DOS 28 includes tender joints, right? It includes a global. And so those were both worse off uh, in those with PTSD and depression, and so there was this borderline association. So sub-analysis, this is uh, fresh off the press as of like yesterday. So one of the advantages of having a data set like this is that you can go back when you ask questions like this and look fairly quickly, because I think it's a good question. And so does having depression or anxiety uh, confound the relationship we reported with smoking? So smoking rates are higher in people with depression, way higher in people with PTSD. PTSD patients, I think that, you know, that's self-medication, at least in the VA, has been my uh, unscientific observation. And what you see are the associations of current smoking with both higher cytokine kind score and DOS 28 are unchanged, and they remain highly significant even after you adjust for depression or anxiety. But I think what's interesting, and actually I have to say surprised me a little bit, is that the PTSD code especially was highly associated with cytokine score uh, and, and depression anxiety. But again, when you put those together in a model, it didn't at all impact what we saw with current smoking with effect sizes that are, that are essentially identical. Um, so it's an interesting question, and I think uh, one we'll have to look more at. So I think uh, that's it. So in conclusion, I, current smoking uh, is associated with higher disease activity in RA. Notice I am an epidemiologist. I never said causes. And I would never say that with a cross-sectional design. It's really important to say that. So current smoking is associated with higher disease activity in RA, independent of other patient factors. Um, it includes cytokines that have been implicated in RA pathogenesis and underscores, I think, what we're already telling patients. And then I hope you, feels be you feel better about you, what you may have not felt good about in terms of your FIB to patients. Um, the favorable effect of smoking cessation does appear, does not appear to be mediated by changes in ACPA, although it would be really interesting if you could do a longitudinal study, and this would be tough. Imagine designing, this is sort of like designing the periodontal treatment study I talked about last night. So you design a smoking cessation study. It would be really interesting to see if changes in rheumatoid factor uh, are mediating variables here. So do you have to decrease the rheumatoid factor to see this effect? And I think what we talked about in the paper is we have data from the same cohort uh, and coupled with in vitro studies showing that rheumatoid factor and ACPA are synergistic in terms of pro-inflammatory effects. When you take immune comp ACPA immune complexes and you co-stimulate macrophages uh, with rheumatoid factor, you see far more uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine expression. And so it's possible that diminishing rheumatoid factor with smoking cessation would have a, a, a favorable effect on the disease. So an, an anecdote and a question. So I, I recently saw a young uh, woman who was like a fitness person, the most beautiful Kardashian teeth and mouth, and no first degree relatives with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and she's in her early 30s with greater than 250 ACPA, and talking to her, um, she has a long history of smoking pot, two, three times a week for many years. Has that been looked at uh, in any of these? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not aware of that at all, but I, based on what I know, uh, it was that a risk factor in her development of CCP and rheumatoid arthritis? I would, I mean, yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know there's anything magical in cigarette smoke. I mean, it's a, you, you rev up the innate immune system. It's a foreign object going into your airways. You know, we, and that's part of the reason I showed this slide with other airway irritants. I don't think it necessarily needs to be cigarette smoke, although I could be wrong. You know, there's 3,000 uh, carcinogen chemicals in cigarette smoke, supposedly 4,000. Which of the 4,000 or what combination of the 4,000, I mean, I don't know. Uh, doesn't appear to be nicotine. So people have taken that on. It doesn't appear to be nicotine. So 
chew your gum. Um, yeah. Uh, you didn't mention periodontitis and looking at that in this, uh, in this particular model. And there are just yeah. tons of papers that suggest that the same effect happens. Um, maybe they're not quite as good as these lovely biopsy studies, but I was very happy to see the last slide. Now, in, in the paper, you, you, didn't, um, you didn't quote a study by Messi. And what they looked at is in the 154 patients followed for a year who were um, smokers and had rheumatoid arthritis, and they treated them with uh, um, uh, biologics, uh, essentially in Flipsonet. And, and what they found was that the DAS didn't respond um, uh, as well as they would have expected it to. And the reason it didn't was that the tender joint count didn't get much better, the patient global didn't get much better, pain that they studied didn't get much better. Whereas the other, quote, objective, swollen joint count, CRP, all got better. Now, they didn't measure depression either. They didn't measure you know, how many, you know, up to 20% of patients who, who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis also have fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is actually a little worse in smokers due to neuropeptide and a bunch of other interactions that happen. So, so they didn't say that, but they said there's something funny about smokers that makes them more painful. And that's exactly what depression, comorbid fibromyalgia does. And that, that would suggest that that last slide that you put up and the, the letter that came to you probably makes some sense. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you, read, uh, if you read the 2013 paper, you know, yeah, we, we agree. And I see that, you know, I see that, sure. in, see that in clinic. If you, I don't know if you've spent time in a VA, but the PTSD patients, you can tell before they walk in the door. So. Yep. Thank you. Again, thank you very much. It's been great.